weapons are more dangerous to the possessors, much more dangerous. And that's why I think it's essential that we stop this mad race in these things. The race is unwinnable. You cannot win it, because whatever you do, he counters. The weapons are unusable. Unilateral restraint won't solve anything. And the world we're headed toward is unlivable, resting on a fragile suspicion base which must be responded to in matters of moments if we see the wrong signals. During a career notable for its diversity, William E. Colby has been active in military service, the practice of law, and government service, ranging from being an attorney with the National Labor Relations Board to the directorship of the Central Intelligence Agency. For his military service in World War II, he received the American Silver Star and Norway's St. Olaf's Medal. For his government service, Mr. Colby received the National Security Medal, the Distinguished Intelligence Medal, and the State Department's Distinguished Honor Award. At the end of World War II, you characterized the position of the United States as dominant in the world and with the security that comes from being dominant. How safe are we now? Well, we share a world in which uh, the Soviets and ourselves can destroy each other. We share a world in which uh, revolutionary groups, uh, uh, zealots and demagogues can destroy our relationships with substantial parts of the globe. We see in Iran a totally irrational leadership uh, p declaring us as the great Satan that uh, threatens all of, all of existence, overthrew a friend of ours. There's criticism of him, yes, but uh, the situation in Iran certainly today is worse off than it was, and our relationships are worse off. It's a very dangerous kind of a world in that respect. Now, that hardly existed in the late 40s, that, that kind of a prospect, and we were decolonializing uh, the, the major colonial empires, uh, giving people an opportunity to become independent, sovereign, on their own, and I, that was mostly working quite well. In the decades since World War II, there has been a substantial increase in military spending. What occurs when one side makes a major investment? The other side matches it. Uh, we have seen that uh, all the way through the recent history. Uh, those people who say, ah, we have achieved a, a, a critical advantage by a certain weapon. Uh, First, the nuclear weapon, and the thermonuclear weapon, and the missiles, and then the, the so-called multiple uh, independently targeted vehicle, the MIRVs. Uh, now we're talking about this wonderful cruise missile of ours that uh, is a fantastic device, there's no doubt about it. But each one of these, up to date, has been matched by the Soviets, and I can guarantee you that the Soviets will develop a cruise missile fleet of their own and we'll just have to be facing a greater level, level of danger in the years ahead. How do you break that cycle? How, do, how does civilization intervene in what it's doing to itself? Well, I think there are two ways. I think one way is for a responsible leader to just reach out and say, stop, let's break through this. I think uh, Jack Kennedy had those feelings. I think uh, Richard Nixon had those feelings, that the only way to stop this madness is somehow to get a mutual arrangement with the other side that you just begin to reduce this crazy uh, arms race. The other way, in the absence of that kind of dynamic leadership, is for the people to take responsibility to press their government to move in that direction. I think that's what you're seeing with the mutual, f with the mutual and verifiable freeze movement. The, uh, the demand by the ordinary citizen who, up till today, uh, really left the whole problem of nuclear weapons to the experts. They were much too complicated, they were much too awesome. The idea of negotiating about them had so many trade-offs that, uh, and the, even the terminology was almost un, un, ununderstandable. But today, the, I think the ordinary citizen in America, in Europe, and even to a degree, a very limited degree in the Soviet Union, because they don't have the kind of public opinion that we do, but in the free countries and in the less developed world, they are saying, look, these things are really very dangerous. We have to get a stop to this mad piling of these weapons up. 
The amount of uh, money wasted on military weapons in the world is astronomical. The degree to which this takes capital from the growth of the developing world is fantastic. Uh, it's the developing countries that are spending a great deal of money on, on weapons, where they should be spending it on industries and agriculture and light industry and services and things of that nature. In your view, if one nation reaches out to another and begin to work in an effective way toward breaking this cycle, can the Russians be trusted to honor their agreements? The experience with the Russians is they certainly cannot be trusted to honor what I call sweetness and light agreements. Uh, generalized statements that we are against war, we're for disarmament, uh, that really won't amount to much. But in the experience of carefully negotiated treaties, very specific ones, with specific arrangements for sanctions, for verification, for action to be taken in case of suspicion, then generally they have complied. There have been so few steps over the edge with respect to the nuclear weapons after SALT-1. But we've had the vehicle with which to stop it and to call it and, and insist that there be a change in the, in the actions. I think that in that sense, I do, I, do, I do not believe that we should trust the Russians. But I do believe that we have the intelligence machinery today to enable us to know whether they will be complying with the treaty or not. And if they begin not to, com to comply with it, then to catch them in a very early stage and begin to talk with them as to whether they're really going to come back into compliance or whether all bets are off and we are also free of compliance in such a situation. Now, that's the, that's the worst uh, alternative. And uh, we have seen on the SALT-1 experience a number of occasions where we've caught the Soviets stepping over the edge, called them on it, and they've pulled back. And I think this is the function of intelligence today, and this is the way you should negotiate and deal with a power as dangerous as this. With your experience and perspective, can the Russians cheat enough with our, with our capacity for verification to make a difference? No, I think uh, this is quite obvious. Uh, you look at today, first thing to realize is that we're going to follow Soviet weapon systems, whether there's ever an agreement between us or not, because we have to. The second thing is we do a very good job of it. All you have to do is look at the reports out of the Defense Department, which describe in excruciating details all kinds of Russian weapons, the numbers, the character, the quality, the capabilities, not just the big nuclear ones, but things like tanks, pieces of artillery, things of that. All those things could are theoretically concealable on an individual item. But we have very good estimates of the total numbers of tanks, of pieces of artillery, and all the rest of it. Enough to do our planning so that we can plan for the actions that we need to face that kind of a problem. Now, the third thing is that in a treaty, that whole process becomes easier rather than more difficult because these treaties have little provisions in them which facilitate the other side monitoring what, whether you are complying or not. And lastly, the question is, uh, if you find a a, uh, some new development in the Soviet Union today uh, and you ask them about it, they will probably tell you it's none of your business. But with a treaty, it is some of your business. And they have to admit it, and they have responded in the ways that I've indicated. So the answer is, can you absolutely say that there's no chance that the Soviets would ever cheat, even in a millimeter size? And the answer is no. The, also, the answer is, it wouldn't make any difference. And the, the number of weapons we have today on both sides, an additional few, would have absolutely no significance. And indeed, our national security is better achieved by getting the Soviets essentially to with reduce and stop building these new weapons with even a marginal possibility of violation than by continuing to pile up the hundreds and hundreds that are planned now. In your view, would the national security of the United States have been enhanced if there had been a treaty against multiple reentry Warheads. Absolutely. Uh, clearly, one of the most dangerous problems we have today is the, is the uh, Soviet multiple reentry warheads. We had a chance possibly to conclude that in, in SALT-1. We skipped it. 
we were way ahead. Why should we limit ourselves on something we had when uh, they didn't have it and they weren't up to us? So we left it out. Now it's our most serious problem. Uh, comparably, uh, the cruise missile today, we're way ahead. So why should we limit the cruise missiles? Well, at the end of this decade, I guarantee you, we're going to have a serious national debate. The Pentagon's already thinking about it according to the press statements, of about the need for a massive air defense system to protect us against Soviet cruise missiles. It's inevitable it'll happen. When uh, Mr. Kennedy uh, had the, the idea of the, the uh, limited chest ban, there was a consideration as to whether we might have a comprehensive test ban in 1963. A comprehensive test ban, no more testing of nuclear weapons. If we had adopted that at that time, we wouldn't have our present generation of weapons on either side. We would have held the nuclear weapon at the level of development it had achieved in 1963, which was a marginal level. It was a dangerous level, but it, we wouldn't be faced with the thousands of them we have today. In 1946, uh, Bernard Baruch had a plan and submitted to the United Nations that would have said that we are going to get rid of our nuclear weapons and no other country would ever have nuclear weapons. The world would be free of them. That plan collapsed because we couldn't trust the Russians and we didn't have good intelligence then. And when Stalin said, no, you cannot have inspections in, into our country to ensure that we are complying, because that would be a form of American espionage into our internal affairs, the idea collapsed. But the test ban idea in 1963 of Mr. Kennedy's said that we could solve that problem by seven inspection visits a year. The Russians were really to, ready to give us three inspection visits a year. And on the difference between those two numbers, we'd have the present nuclear arsenals. Now, today we don't need those visits to that degree. We may need them in some respect. The Soviets have again indicated they're prepared for inspection visits. I'm not a great believer in the inspection visit as the be-all and end-all. Because after all, the Soviets invented the Potemkin, the Russians invented the Potemkin village. And uh, I'm sure they could pull the wool over a few inspection team's eyes. But with the concept of central intelligence, gathering all the information and all the hints, and all the sources of information and the technology, the satellites, the electronics and all the rest of it, I'm convinced that uh, we are at a stage where we could monitor this kind of a stop and we could stop. And then we wouldn't have the next generation of these terrible weapons. We just talked about uh, the lost opportunity with past generations of choices. Let me give you several choices that are coming up and ask for your thinking on them. One topical item now here is a treaty on anti-satellite weapons. But in a sense, it's really a precursor of other choices down the line where new generations of weapons that will be very expensive will continue to be the product of a, of a very burgeoning technological uh, capacity for innovation. What's your thinking about that treaty, the pros and cons? Well, the anti-satellite treaty, I think we should suspend tests on right now. Uh, the, so the argument is the Soviets have tested one. Yes, they did a low-orbit one some years ago, which had an effectiveness of about 50% minimal. Now, obviously, at a low orbit, since we and the Soviets have put two satellites together, it's really not very hard to put two satellites, on, uh, one of your satellites up next to one of his, and blow it up. So it's not that complicated. But they stopped further testing a while ago. We said we are going to test one which is going up to middle orbits. If we do, they will go up to middle orbits. They'll steal the secrets from us in some fashion, or they'll put themselves to work on it and, and do the same thing. Here's a chance to stop this kind of a weapon system today. But our position is, oh no, we're going to have to test because we've got to catch up to them. When what we're catching up to is very marginal. Uh, the, the Soviets are very deeply concerned about the president's Star Wars idea because they have great respect for American technology. They know that if the Americans decided to put a man on the moon in a decade of the 1960s, by golly, at the end of the 60s, there he was, right up there on the moon. And they're sure that it may be 20 years, it may be 30 years away, but if the Americans go in for a massive Star Wars program, sooner or later we'll get it. 
and they'll have to put all the effort involved into developing a comparable system, one that, uh, that contests it and counters it and all the rest of it. Do you think defense is possible in a nuclear age? Well, it is not really feasible to, to say what the president's proposal it, uh, proposes, which is to bar any nuclear weapon from hitting our soil. Now, if the Soviets launch a thousand missiles aimed at our, t our country, and we have a magnificent defense device, it may be 95% effective. Now, if you do the arithmetic, that means 50 nuclear weapons land on America. Now, the 950 don't, but they can do an awful lot of damage with 50, with even one or two, for that matter. Now, I think the deterrence is where we've rested to date, and as I said, the problem is that the deterrence is getting increasingly fragile because of the nature of the technology and the kinds of weapons that are being developed. So, essentially, defense against them, no. Elimination of them, yes. Do you think an anti-ballistic missile treaty at this point would be destabilizing? Well, we have one, and I think we should keep it. Uh, it was a remarkable achievement that Mr. Nixon achieved. That agreement to, for both countries not to develop nationwide anti-ballistic missile systems, to leave themselves exposed to the other. The fact was that uh, this wasn't a, just all that brilliant a thought. I mean, the idea was that if we developed one, they would develop one. We'd be mutually deterring each other again, with both of us more frightened that the other sides might be effective and thereby he might be tempted to launch a strike against us. And we would have spent something in the order of $100 billion to produce something that wouldn't have been effective. Now, we have exactly the same problem that we're, that we're facing for the future of the Star Wars concept. We could produce billions and billions of dollars, uh, some say $25 trillion or something, to uh, produce a Star Wars system. And it really wouldn't be effective. And would it ultimately abrogate the oh, very certainly. treaty you were just talking certainly, about? Certainly, because the, the treaty says that we will not develop a defense against nuclear weapons. Uh, inherently, it, it violates that treaty and would have to uh, supplant it. One of the shifts in public opinion in the United States in the last decades has been in favor of a bilateral nuclear freeze. Would one make any difference if there was one? I think so, indeed. I think there are a number of weapons on the drawing boards in this country, a number of weapons on the drawing board in that country, the Soviet Union, which would be stopped by that kind of a freeze. On our side, we would stop the MX, which is, I think, a marginal weapon, not of any value, really, and just plain dangerous. We would stop the B-1 bomber. We would stop the, the, uh, the D-5 missile, the submarine-launched missile. On the Soviet side, they would stop the development of a number of new weapons on their side. The SS-24, uh, greater accuracy in their submarine-launched weapons, more uh, airborne uh, weapons. The cruise missiles on both sides would be stopped. Uh, it certainly would stop the development of uh, just piling up more weapons on each side. The problem is not just a waste. The problem is more complicated that, than that. The new weapons are more dangerous to the possessors, much more dangerous. And that's why I think it's essential that we stop this mad race in these things. The race is unwinnable. You cannot win it, because whatever you do, he counters. The weapons are unusable. Unilateral restraint won't solve anything. And the world we're headed toward is unlivable, resting on a fragile suspicion and base which must be responded to in matters of moments if we see the wrong signals. You've applied this line of thinking to the MX missile. Why do you not feel that that will really strengthen the national security of the United States? Well, the MX missile is, uh, is really a weapon which uh, has no value at all. It's, uh, it's a weapon which is non-defensible. Uh, we've been looking for a way to base it for the last 10 years and uh, gone through a hundred odd different ideas and uh, none of them works. So we're going to put it in some holes, which we decided a long time ago would not be an adequate protection for it. 
it's a it's a weapon which uh, has no great advantage over our present weapon systems in terms of the, the uh, targeting it's bigger than our present ones but when we built our present ones we looked at the wh whether we should build big ones or not we decided our general staff decided no we need small accurate ones and so we built small accurate ones the soviets went and built a lot of big ones and so suddenly we say well we need big ones because they have big ones not because we need them but because they have them. What about That's the a kind of an adolescent reaction. He has a, a bigger baseball bat, so I need a bigger baseball bat. What about the argument that it shows national will? Well, that's the only justification put up for it by this Kolkroft Commission that looked into the MX. They said the thing isn't really useful, it's dangerous, and not very valuable. But they said we should build it to show national will and determination. I think there are lots of better ways to show national will and determination than building useless weapons and dangerous weapons. That doesn't show much uh, wisdom. It may show will and determination, but I'd rather show some wisdom with it. What for you would be actions that would show wisdom? Well, reaching across to the Soviets and indicating that we perceive their fears and their concerns and insist that they understand our fears and our concerns and uh, negotiate with them, uh, not from a point of view of one-upping them, but from a point of view of seeking out a, a relationship that will be beneficial to both sides, will save both sides useless and even dangerous activity. What, what process to you is viable? We've negotiated three treaties in the last two decades that have been signed by both presidents uh, and been not ratified by our Senate, including SALT II. Now, well, here I think you have, you've got your finger on the question that you asked earlier. How do you accomplish this? And I said either by a particularly brilliant leader or by pressure from the, from the base, from the population as a whole. And I think at the moment, uh, we really have to have our own negotiating proposals looked at. President Reagan said that he didn't realize that his initial negotiating pr proposal would have required the Soviets to eliminate something like three-quarters of their land-based system and wouldn't have affected ours much at all. Now, if our leader doesn't realize what the impact of his proposal on the other side is, you don't have a negotiation. You've got to think it out and work up a negotiation that does recognize the concerns of the other side. So that's the first thing, is to develop a proper negotiating position. They've certainly told us what they're concerned about. They're concerned about the anti-satellite. They're concerned about the Star Wars. They're concerned about the MX. They're concerned about the D-5. They're concerned about the cruise missile. They have a big thing about the cruise missile. Now, all of those are in their concerns. Now, what are our concerns? We're concerned about some of their new ones. We're concerned about some of their tactical level ones, the uh, intermediate ones in Europe, the SS-20. Now, those are concerns on our side. Now, I think out of that realization of which, what concerns each side, one can construct negotiations which give a reasonable balance. This doesn't mean that they will immediately accept it. They're very tough, hard bargainers. And sometimes their bargaining is very negativist and uh, really is not seeking a, a solution. But then, as in any contract negotiation that we all go through, even when we buy a used car, whatever, you then give a little to get him to come towards you. And uh, that's the nature of the negotiation we're in doubt. There's nothing very unique or mysterious about it. You're just trying to make a deal with the other fellow, and he's a used car salesman, and you're a rather simple, uh, open society, and uh, you've got to watch that you don't get euchred by it, but uh, there are ways in which you can buy used cars and drive away quite happily. Your assessment is that with our new national means of verification, that arms control treaties can be a viable way for increasing the security of the United States. Yes, this, uh, the, the intelligence business is the mechanic that investigates your, your used car and sees whether it's any good or not before you buy it. Okay. Uh, we investigate it after we've bought it to make sure that it stays good. A second uh, way that you've indicated that wisdom can be shown is bringing about needed social and economic change in countries that are at risk around the world. 
Now, that doesn't really deal quite so much with the Soviet problem. It deals with the other problem of our national security. Now, we receive millions of people in this country every year as refugees, as uh, migrants, and so forth. Now, we're not going to solve that by putting up barriers at our, at our borders. The way we're going to solve that is to get the economies of some of those countries, and particularly the lands to the south of us, booming so that they have jobs and hope there and don't have to come here to seek their livelihood. Now, that, I think, is a, a move toward our national security. It's uh, the security of our our communities, our urban cities. It's the security of our relationship between our citizens here, not to have a whole new wave of outsiders coming in and then have to be absorbed and all the rest of it. At one time in your service to the country, you had the occasion to tell President Brezhnev of the Soviet Union that the more we know about each other, the safer we will be. What were you hoping he would understand from that? Well, I was hoping that he would understand that that is the real function of intelligence today, to clarify on both sides misunderstanding. Now, I wish I could have said that he agreed with me, but he turned and passed along. That's a very big jump for Soviets the, 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 to open themselves up. They're fearful of it. They, they've been invaded a few times. They're fearful of uh, the, the, they're, they're in awe of American society and the way it works and the enormous productivity. And they're just afraid that uh, there is enough negative attitude toward the Soviets here uh, that it would be dangerous for them to open themselves entirely. But they are opening. They are, they are being forced to open by the march of technology, by the satellites, by the, the way transportation and communication works nowadays. They can't run a totally pre-Meiji Japan society closing off the rest of the world. They are becoming more open, and they've, they've made some steps in this direction, really quite, quite exceptional steps for Soviets of announcing their number of nuclear missiles, telling us how many. For a long time, they wouldn't admit it. They knew we knew, but they didn't want to say so. Because if they said so, they had to tell their own people as well. So they went through this myth that these things were secrets when they really weren't. We knew all about them. But now they've made a, that minor step of opening slightly. You're dealing with a very reluctant empire trying to open itself and adjust to the modern world. But when the students uh, on the streets of Moscow will pay $100, $150 for a pair of jeans, you know that something's going on. That opening, that yearning for contact with the, with the real world out here it does exist. It's still very limited, still very controlled, but it's an inevitable process. Mr. Colby, thank you for sharing with us today your insights to the way to a more peaceful world in the nuclear age. Mm -hmm.